Hello, everyone. My name is Giuseppe Martinico. I'm a professor of comparative public law at the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pisa, and I'm also one of the editors of Diritti Comparati. I'll be your host today, and I'm very happy and also a bit excited because uh, we have with us a giant of comparative constitutional law, Professor Mark Tashnet, who kindly accepted to give a short interview for our blog. Mark, Tash, Mark Tashnet is a William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law Emeritus at Harvard Law School. He served as a law clerk to uh, Justice uh, Thurgood Marshall. Uh, he is a great expert in the field of constitutional law and theory, including comparative constitutional law. His research includes, among other things, studies of constitutional review in the United States and around the world and uh, uh, also studies in constitutional history uh, with works on the development of civil rights law in, in the United States. Professor Tashnet, how are you? Thanks, uh, thanks indeed for accepting our invitation. Uh, I, I'm fine and uh, I'm looking forward to the interview. Great. So let's move to the, the first question. In, uh, in your latest book uh, written with uh, uh, Bojan Bugaric, and then in other papers of yours, you have reflected a lot on the relationship between constitutionalism and populism. I would like to start precisely with the question related to this. What is the relationship between popular constitutionalism and populism? Can one speak as some academics have done of a populist constitutionalism? In other words, can there, uh, can there be such a thing as a populist constitutionalism in your view? So uh, I think it's useful to distinguish between these two ideas, one of popular constitutionalism and the other of populist constitutionalism. So for me, at least, uh, popular constitutionalism, pop the first of those ideas, refers to the understanding that ordinary people have of the meaning of the Constitution, uh, as opposed to the meaning given to it by professional lawyers or constitutional court judges. Um, in the United States, at least, there's a long tradition of social movements that uh, have developed their own ideas about what the Constitution means with respect to racial equality or economic equality. And those ideas have been First, in general, at the outset, inconsistent with the lawyer's understanding, but second, over time, have come to influence uh, what the official understanding is. Okay, so that's a popular constitutionalism refers to a practice of actually interpreting the Constitution um, by, as I put it, ordinary people. Populist constitutionalism refers for me to the, um, refers to the political and constitutional agenda of organized political parties that present themselves as speaking for the people of the nation. Uh, and the, the, the forms of populist constitutionalism vary a great deal. There is, of course, prominently uh, conservative forms of populist constitutionalism, uh, the kind of thing that people refer to in connection with Hungary and Poland. Uh, but there are also progressive or left-wing versions of populist constitutionalism, uh, um, which in the book we associate with uh, Podemos in Spain, Syriza in uh, Greece, and to some extent, Five Star in, uh, in Italy. Uh, so the content of the populist constitutional agenda varies depending on its political valence. There are two things that are, I think, common to almost all versions of populist constitutionalism. One is a willingness to reconsider settled constitutional arrangements when those arrangements 
interfere with the ability of the populist government to achieve the political goals that it was elected to achieve. So in shorthand, uh, uh, populist governments are typically more willing to amend the Constitution than non-populist governments are. And second, but related, the purpose of amendments is what's sometimes described as instrumental. Uh, that is, it aims at making it easier for the governments to actually enact and implement the programs that they were elected to, enact, uh, to, to implement, uh, rather than trying to uh, achieve some, I would put it abstract or formal symmetry or attractiveness of the constitutional arrangements. For populists, and for me, uh, the point of a constitution is to enable governments to accomplish uh, what they say they, what, what they're elected to accomplish, of course, within substantive limits of mostly human rights. Uh, okay, so that's, the, that's my take on the distinction. Thanks indeed. Uh, your book is titled Power to the People, Constitutionalism in the Age of Populism. I look forward to reading it. It, it, it looks uh, great. And in the, same, in the same vein, what do you think about these apparently oxymoronic uh, labels as illiberal democracy or, or, or illiberal uh, constitutionalism? What's your uh, view um, on this uh, formula? I have a long-term project that probably will never uh, see the light of day uh, called Varieties of Constitutionalism uh, uh, because I do think there are a number of forms of constitutionalism uh, available in the world. Now, of course, for most of us, uh, we want to define constitutionalism as liberal constitutionalism, which has a fairly robust set of principles associated with it. <clears throat> a certain kind of separation of powers um, uh, and a particularly robust set of rights guarantees for some. Those rights guarantees are limited to classical liberal rights such as uh, uh, equality and free expression. For others, the rights include social and economic uh, rights, and for still others, uh, they include cultural and uh, environmental rights. But this is all within a generally, as I have said, liberal political framework. Uh, and that's what most of us think. Um, my own view is that we, we can, of course, define constitutionalism to mean liberal constitutionalism, uh, and, and that's fine as long as we're clear about what, what's going on. But it, it's also clear to me that there are other, fo other forms of constitutionalism uh, available in the world. Um, so I spent a long time investigating the form of constitutionalism in Singapore, which I describe as authoritarian constitutionalism. Singapore has reasonably free and fair elections. They are manipulated a bit, but they're not uh, grossly, uh, the outcomes don't grossly distort what the people of Singapore actually prefer. Um, they have a, on issues not directly concerned to uh, the governing party, they have an independent judiciary, um, and on issues of concern to the party, the ju judges are sort of socialized anyway to think that the party's positions are the right way to interpret the Constitution. Um, dissidents are able to express their dissent without worrying about being thrown in jail, although they do have to worry about 
how they will be able to make a living in a nation state where the government controls a great deal of the resources. So, uh, so Singapore is not a liberal constitutional uh, state. It's also not an authoritarian state. The constitution does matter uh, uh, in, in Singapore. Um, I think it's useful to have uh, an idea of authoritarian constitution available. I've also thought about, but have not done sufficient research on this to be confident about it, but I've thought about the possibility of a theocratic constitutionalism in which some regulations of human life that liberals would find impermissible might be justified by direct reference to theological presuppositions. Um, I think the clearest case of that these days is Iran, uh, but I think there are at least historically others, um, and at least in, again in the United States, there's an emerging discussion of a um, conservative Roman Catholic version that being called common good constitutionalism in the United States. Um, um, whether we sh whether I, I don't I guess I'd say some people, Lee Kuan Yew in um, Singapore and Victor Orban in Hungary have been attracted to the formulation illiberal constitutionalism. I, I'm not sure that that's helpful to describe even what they are trying to do. Um, uh, Orban certainly wants to set up a distinction, an opposition between his version of constitutionalism and the one prevailing in, let's say, Western Europe. Um, and because Western Europeans say we have liberal constitutionalism, he wants to say we have illiberal constitutionalism. Uh, uh, I think there are better ways to describe the kind of conservative, nationalist, um, prescriptive constitutionalism that Orban is promoting. Thanks indeed. That's a very uh, fascinating project. Uh, uh, great. Um, I would like to um, move to a different topic, although it, it is uh, really, uh, of course, semi-related to that. Uh, the last uh, uh, months of the uh, Trump presidency have been characterized by the big issue of the selection and appointment of the federal Supreme Court uh, justices. In your opinion, what reforms are needed in this respect to improve uh, the American system? Thank you. So I should disclose that I have been a prominent, uh, I don't know, prominent, but I've been a proponent of expanding the size of the Supreme Court, and I'm associated with one of the lobbying groups that's uh, in favor uh, of doing that. Um, I think one thing about the U.S. system that deserve the, the current state of affairs in the United States is that our system for selecting and retaining judges um, generally has operated in a way that allows for some I don't, reasonable um, coordination or, um, uh, well, uh, reasonable parallelism between what's happening in the wider political system and what's happening in the courts. A famous article from 1957 uh, says that the U.S. Supreme Court has never been for long far out of line with the values of the governing coalition. Um, now, that's true uh, historically, but the institutional mechanisms for doing that uh, have involved a certain kind of randomness, uh, and they've been subject to, I would say, manipulation 
over the past generation, uh, with the effect that for a substantial period, a decade or more, um, there's been a misalignment between the Supreme Court and the, as the political scientists put it, governing coalition. It's a very complicated story, but uh, uh, what what what's the problem is that the court has gotten, as some people put it, out of balance. Um, doesn't always have to be exactly the same as what you know, is happening in the political system, but over time there ought to be some degree of reasonable correspondence. And that's not happening. Uh, there are lots of numbers that you could uh, generate that are produced in the US uh, to show this. Um, and in addition, and this is important in the Italian uh, context, um, uh, there's a long tradition of, in the United States, of judges having uh, and uh, being known to have uh, deep political affiliations that generate their, or that are, um, uh, that interact with their views of proper constitutional interpretation. And so in the United States, it's relatively easy to say a judge appointed by a Republican president is likely to have a set of fairly conservative views about policy outcomes and about constitutional interpretation um, and will use constitutional interpretation to achieve those policy outcomes. And similarly for Democratic uh, judges appointed by Democratic presidents, there's a much weaker tradition of what I would characterize as professionalist constraint on judges in the US than there is elsewhere in the world. Um, now, uh, I, the most dramatic example is in, for me, is in England, uh, Great Britain, where this professionalist tradition is extremely strong. Um, um, I do know that Italian constitutionalists occasionally advert to the political affiliate, the prior political affiliations of judges on the constitutional court. Uh, and I actually don't know uh, the extent to which Italian constitutional jurisprudence maps onto uh, political uh, programs. On the other hand, the Italian political system is so complex in its coalitional nature that this kind of correspondence that you get in the U.S. between Republican and Democrats actually may not work out well in an Italian system anyway. But when you put everything together, the closeness of ideology to political affiliation in the U.S., coupled with the um, either manipulation of the appointment process or its random operation uh, over the past 20 years as sort of an extreme, uh, there is, in my view, some need to, as some people put it, rebalance the Supreme Court. Then the question is, what are the mechan best mechanisms for rebalancing the court? And, and my view, although it's not, the view is increasingly widely held, but still not a majority view, is that the most effective way to rebalance would be to expand the size of the Supreme Court. Thanks so much. Um, uh, the next question is about the recent the recent case law of, of, of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, you recently commented on, on uh, some judicial developments uh, concerning abortion in the case law of the U.S. Supreme Court. What impact might this case law have on the struggle for rights in the United States, to your view? So, once again, the story is a, a complicated one. Um, uh, uh, the, the standard story uh, about uh, uh, struggles for rights in the U.S. is that you have social movements the civil rights movement in the 1960s, the women's movement in the 70s and 80s, uh, who 
uh, that, that generate ideas about what the Constitution should be, uh, how it should be interpreted. Um, I, I should add to this a conservative movement in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, and they, through a variety of mechanisms, influence uh, the way judges think about rights. Uh, the mechanisms include appointment of judges sympathetic to this, the social movements or reflection by sitting judges on the arguments made by these social movements, uh, but the standard story is social movements generate ideas of generate ideas of rights that then influence the court. But there's another story, uh, most prominently associated with the conservatives in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, but likely to uh, uh, recur in the event that the court turns extremely conservative in its holdings, which is, call it a counter-mobilization against the court. So assume, as I think it's fair to say, uh, quite likely, that the US Supreme Court uh, uh, substantially limits the constitutional availability, uh, the constitutional right of uh, a woman to choose to have an abortion. Exactly what the limit will be, we don't know. Uh, uh, it might be eliminating the constitutional claim completely, um, uh, but it's, it might not it might not go that far. Uh, but assume that something along those lines occurs. It's I think quite likely that there will be a counter mobilization to say your interpretation of the Constitution is wrong. We think that there is, is a constitutional right to choose with respect to abortion. And we are going to demonstrate in the streets and we're going to lobby our representatives to implement that right. Um, there are a variety of forms that that counter, that variety of particular goals that that counter mobilization could seek, could seek national legislation protecting the right to choose. It could seek court expansion to overturn the court's restrictive decisions and the like. Um, but uh, I think one of the consequences of this, what I've called the out of balanceness of the Supreme Court is that you will see political mobilizations aimed at attempting to rebalance the court. Thanks indeed, Professor Tashnet. Um, my next question is uh, more methodological perhaps. Uh, what potential do quantitative studies uh, and quantitative methods um, in constitutional law, every European, do you, do you think they are useful? Do you think they are uh, very important that I mean nowadays? So I, I, I am a, uh, an avid consumer of these studies. Um, I think they sometimes lend, uh, shed some light on some interesting uh, issues. But I am generally quite skeptical about uh, how far you can go with them. Um, the first level uh, uh, observation is that in the comparative field, almost everything that has been done um, in this quantitative vein uh, has involved studies of the texts of constitutions. And uh, I think we all know that the texts of the constitutions do not, at the very least, fully represent the constitutional system. They may be the starting point for the constitutional system, but they are certainly not uh, the end. Um, for me, of course, I, coming from the United States, uh, the uh, uh, things that these quantitative studies leave out are judicial interpretations of, uh, the, uh, of the constitutional provisions. 
There are ongoing efforts attempting to build chord interpretations into the quantitative databases. Um, I think the methodological problems of doing so are quite serious, but maybe you know, methodologists will be able to solve them. Beyond that, there are aspects of constitutional systems that are um, captured, not even in court opinions, but in well understood practices among people dealing with the Constitution, meaning political actors and lawyers. Again, there are ways to try to capture what those practices are, but uh, the quantitative, st quantitative studies are only just beginning to deal with those. Um, uh, let me give you one example uh, of some of, the pro some of the issues that are associated with these quantitative studies here focusing primarily on texts. Uh, recently, there's a prize-winning book uh, uh, published by Adam Chilton and Mila Versteeg that looks at which rights expressed in constitutions uh, turn out to be effectively implemented on the ground where effective implementation is measured by um, opinion surveys of of insider, people who know the systems well. They find that mere individual rights are not well um, implemented compared to what they call organizational rights, rights of entities like unions and uh, religious communities, churches. Um, uh, now, they argue that the reason for that is that organizations can mobilize to protect their rights more effectively than individuals can. Um, there's a certain intuitive force to that kind of argument. Um, when you unpack it, it turns out that uh, the mechanisms for more effective implementation of organizational rights and individual rights are um, quite similar. There may be differences, there are differences, but they're not, in my view, dramatic enough to support the argument that organizational rights are more effectively implemented because organizations can mobilize more effectively to protect them. There's something else going on. Um, and now it's very interesting to think about what's, what's going on. Uh, uh, my, my view is that what's going on is what I call something like a simple-minded uh, popular textualism. You look at the Constitution and it says, we have these rights. Uh, and, and, and then somebody says, yeah, you do have those rights and I'm going to help you implement them. Now, that somebody can be an organization, but it also can be an ambitious political candidate. Uh, and that's the tricky part of the argument. So the Children Versteeg study is very interesting and deserves the, uh, the recognition it's received. Uh, but it's more complicated than the argument that they specifically lay out. Uh, my own view is that that's true of a lot of the quantitative work. Very thought-provoking, but only the initial step towards understanding uh, what it purports to, uh, to deal with. I do agree. Thanks, indeed. My final question um, is the following. Uh, what topics would you advise young comparatives to explore? That's a big question, I know. But... Yeah. <laughs> so the, the fundamental answer is uh, not, if you find a topic that interests you, uh, look at it. Because the field is, in my view, uh, relatively young. And there's a lot to say about a lot of things. Um, I suppose that, uh, now having said that, um, if I were advising somebody uh, I would say, uh, 
probably um, an, a fruitful area to engage with is um, the, this language is always very tricky, but new generations of rights, meaning cultural, environmental, uh, and uh, uh, rights of non-human animals. Um, uh, not for me at the normative level, but this reflects my uh, um, location in the United States and the way I think about uh, constitutional law, uh, think about how those rights are or could be implemented on the ground, actually implemented, how they interact with uh, other rights. So for example, we know that there are systemic tensions between the rights of indigenous peoples to control the resources within their uh, traditional areas of residence and both social and economic rights and traditional liberal rights. Um, you know, so th th this is, these conflicts have come up in Latin America. So suppose you have an indigenous group, uh, many people, many members of which actually want to sell off their local resources uh, to get a better lifestyle. Um, that's a conflict between the indigenous rights and property rights. Um, or uh, um, this has occurred in Ecuador with some regularity, the indigenous people want to retain their uh, control over these resources. The government says we need to sell them in order to finance uh, a, a widespread program of social welfare. Uh, that's a conflict between social and economic rights with the rights of indigenous people. Um, um, I, I think similar issues are gonna come up with respect to a whole range of uh, matters. Um, I, I, you know, uh, I haven't thought deeply about uh, rights of non-human animals, but uh, clearly in India, there are complicated questions about protecting those rights uh, uh, and uh, protecting the rights of religious minorities in India. Um, language policy is a similar, uh, poses similar kinds of difficulties. That, so, that's, I, I would be an avid consumer of work by younger scholars exploring those issues. Thanks indeed to Professor Tashnet. Uh, thanks for your time and for your generosity. Uh, we are very grateful. Uh, this means a lot to us. Uh, this means a lot to Dilit uh, Comparati. Uh, but really, I mean, uh, it, it, it has been a pleasure that I'm so, I'm so excited that I had the uh, the privilege to to interview you. Uh, thanks indeed.